All right, well, turn to Romans chapter 11. We're back in our study of Romans this morning. We've been away from it uh, for a few weeks because of my absence and then a couple of uh, topical messages, Father's Day uh, last week, spiritual warfare the, the week before. Uh, and uh, so we uh, certainly need to maybe backpedal here a little bit and just remind ourselves where we've been in our study of Romans. In chapter 1 to 8, we looked at principles of righteousness, the first one being that all are condemned. <laughs> Uh, there is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are no exceptions, whether you're a religious person or a non-religious person. Uh, and then we're all without excuse because everybody's got the same witnesses in terms, at least, uh, the general witness of creation and the internal witness of the conscience. And to the Jews in particular, they had the special revelation of Scripture themselves. Uh, but so all are condemned and without excuse but then we learn that we can be justified by faith alone, that it's grace, our faith uh, in uh, Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Uh, God extends his grace and his mercy to us and we can be saved. We can be justified, a judicial term where the judges pronounces us not guilty before God. We then looked at the work of the Holy Spirit to change us or conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Unlike justification, which is a one-time act, it's a process. Uh, we even did a whole message on, uh, from 2 Corinthians 3.18 where Paul says, We all with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory and we're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And we talked about that process of God's Spirit as we are in God's Holy Word and God's Holy Spirit uh, then working in our lives to change us to the image of Jesus Christ. And then after that, we looked at the security of the believer in chapter 8, uh, which begins, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, and it ends that there is no separation. We come to chapter 9, 10, and 11, which really deals with Israel in particular, and some would say, and why is that there? It seems to be just kind of uh, thrown in, uh, and so perhaps we should just jump to the practical aspects of Romans, which begins uh, in chapter 12. But in reality, if we can't settle the issue of what happened to Israel, who had the promises, who rejected the Messiah, who suffered a judgment in 70 AD, <clears throat> if the promises are not still good for them, why would we believe that God's promises are for the church going to be good and true also? So this becomes uh, basically the illustration in one sense. Uh, is there really truly no condemnation? Is there no separation? Will God be faithful to his promises? And Paul says, well, look at the nation of Israel. Uh, look at what they had and all the privileges they had, but look at what became of them, the rejection of the Messiah. And he would answer, or we attempted to answer the question in chapter 9, has God's plan failed? And certainly uh, Paul would say it hasn't. And he gave uh, uh, many illustrations and, and references to Old Testament uh, uh, stories and so forth of that. And one of them, I think the classic was the quotation from Hosea itself uh, there in chapter 9, where he says uh, in verse 25, I call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you're not my people, that they shall be called the sons of the living God. Uh, there is a time where God's people are not called his people. What was that time? Well, northern Israel. Uh, the Israel is, uh, kingdom of Israel in the north, those ten tribes, basically had rejected God, fallen into a tremendous idolatry, and so therefore God judges the nation. He judges the nation through the, uh, the Assyrians, predicted by the prophets, but as Paul points out, but he saves individuals out of the nation at the same time he's able to judge the nation, and that's what's happening right now, <clears throat> Paul would say in the first century. Uh, God is going to judge the Jews as a nation because of the rejection of the Messiah, but he saves individuals out of that nation. Uh, it was true in Paul's day. It continues to be true uh, in this day. And uh, therefore, uh, our first point is this idea of a, a remnant, the remnant of believers. Now, if your wife does it so, you may not know what a remnant is, but it's a part of the whole. If uh, uh, you were to... Uh, uh, work up the courage one day to go into a fabric store with your wife. Uh, she might head back towards the area where the remnants are because they're going to be discounted because it's a portion of the whole. The fabric's sold on that roll so far down that 
Well, you might be able to squeak one Aloha shirt out of it if there's a, a couple of yards there. And as my wife has done very often, why is it the fabric I want, the one they don't have enough of? But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, she buys the remnant. It's usually cheaper. It's a portion uh, of the larger amount. God's always had a remnant, no matter what was going on uh, in Israel. And Paul's point here is we'll see he has a remnant today. In terms of why is this important for us to uh, study this, and I have to tell you, most don't. Most would just skip right through this. It becomes critical because most of the church, 85%, would not even study, not even read, not even believe what Paul is saying here. I mean, his whole point in in verse 1, he'll say, has God rejected his people, Israel? He'll say, certainly not. But 85% of the church today says, yes, he has. They have a little disagreement with the Bible there with the Apostle Paul. And it starts very on in church history. And I just want to read, kind of help us uh, set this thing up, is that why, why would we even study this? Why is this important to us? It's important to us, again, because if God has failed in his promises to Israel, he might fail in his promises to us. And God wants us to be secure in those things. If we don't understand it, we, like much of the church and much of the world, moving in this direction of anti-Semitism, well, we could fall into uh, that uh, as well. Uh, And it's a dangerous thing. Let me go back first a little bit just in history and just say that by 150 A.D. we have something called the Epistle uh, of Barnabas. It wasn't the Barnabas in the Bible. I just think, you know, if it was the Epistle of Harry, I I don't know if it had a good ring to it. So they picked a Bible name. Uh, Whoever the author was, what we do know is that very early on uh, you have a growing sense of anti-Semitism within the leaders of the church, which at this point has become predominantly Gentile very early on. By the time you have the church institutionalized in the fourth century under Roman Catholicism, that begins to grow and becomes institutionalized and grows tremendously throughout Western, uh, Western Europe so that there's a, a great persecution. Uh, and just to uh, uh, read an article about that, and this was published a few years ago in July <coughs> 2011 by uh, Giulio Mio, uh, Mio, Mioti. It's got to be Italian, sorry. Not good on the Italian. Should have asked uh, Matt Pizzulli how to pronounce this guy's name. But uh, he says a few days ago, this couple years ago, UK researchers found that 17 skeletons belonged to Jews who were at the bottom of a medieval well in Norwich, England. The Jews were murdered in a pogrom or had been forced to commit suicide rather than submit to demands for conversion to Christianity. The bodies date back to the 12th, 13th century at a time when Jewish people faced killings, banishment, persecution throughout all Europe. Those 17 Jews were killed because of replacement theology. Again, this belief that the church has replaced the nation of Israel. Uh, The most ancient Christian... uh, uh, arguing that because of their denial of the divinity of Christ, the Jews have forfeited God's promises to them, which have been transferred to the church. Some 10 centuries later, so currently, global Christian forums are reviving this theological uh, demonology against the heirs of those 17 Jews, the Jews of the state of Israel. The World Council of Churches, an economical Christian body uh, based in Geneva, boasting 590 million worshipers, uh, just entered a four-day conference in the Greek city of Volos. Not a single word of criticism was uttered there against the Islamists who are persecuting Arabs who believe in Jesus. Lutherans arrived to Volos from the United States, Catholics from, and Protestants from Bethlehem and Nazareth, or Orthodox Christians from Greece and Russia, lecturers from Beirut and the Copts of Egypt. Uh, the conference declared the Jewish state a sin and an occupying force. It accused the Israelis of dehumanizing the Palestinians, theologically dismantling the chosenness of the Jewish people and called for resistance as a, as a Christian duty. Uh, replacement theology, it's brought tremendous anti-Semitism within the church. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't end with Roman Catholicism because it carries right on into the, uh, the reformers. Martin Luther, of course, he was the Protestant reformer protesting against three doctrines. He said that we need to hold to scripture alone and not uh, allow someone else to have authority over God's word. Uh, We hold to grace alone, that we're saved by grace alone and not by works. Be part of our discussion this morning uh, in that uh, he believed in the priesthood of every believer. There's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Those three doctrines he was protesting against, therefore Protestant. Uh, Early on in his ministry, he wrote a pamphlet entitled, Jesus Was Born a Jew. In it, he said, 
Quote, I would advise and beg everyone to deal kindly with the Jews and to instruct them in the scriptures. In such cases, we expect them to come over to us or to come to the belief that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Uh, he didn't have much success uh, in his evangelistic attempts with the Jews, uh, and as a result, later, he writes a series of tracts that are very anti-Semitic, one of them called Concerning the Jews and Their Lies, where he, quote, admonished Christians to destroy Jewish homes and synagogues with fire, cover them with dirt, to silence rabbis on pain of death, seizure of Jewish wealth, and the enslavement of young Jews for hard labor. To sum up, dear brothers and nobles who have Jews in your domains, if this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one so that you, uh, so that you and we may all be free of this insufferable devilish burden, the Jews. That's Martin Luther, the reformer. That's why once in a while I quote him and say, I don't agree with all of his theology, but <clears throat> just make this one little point here. Very anti-Semitic. Now one writer after that said, many literate Jews have not forgotten this, and some argue that Adolf Hitler simply brought to flower the seed planted by Martin Luther. And it hasn't changed. I just read about a month ago, and I think I posted it on our uh, Facebook account, <clears throat> an article by uh, Tuvia Tinnaboom, who doesn't mean much to us, but apparently is a very well-known writer in, <clears throat> in Western Europe, in which she was um, uh, asked to come to Germany and write a book about uh, the state of uh, Jewish thought in Germany, in modern Germany, and this is all very, very recently. Uh, she spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, researching the book. Uh, she said, I interviewed people from all walks of life, from the famous chain-smoking iconic chancellor Helmut Schmidt to the forlorn heroin addicts in the streets of Frankfurt. She said she interviewed uh, museum guards, World War II veterans, uh, high schoolers, radical leftists, neo-Nazis, uh, top officials of Mercedes and Volkswagen, she said, to the street sellers of cheap necklaces, the educated and the illiterate. And uh, quite a study it was. She writes her book, and the one thing she comes away with is the fact that, well, the people in Germany today are pretty anti-Semitic. And uh, as a Jew writing, she had uh, no idea, though, having visited Germany many times. She said, hardly a day passed without at least one interviewee talking to me about the rich Jews and the shrewd Jews, the Israelis who eat Palestinians for breakfast on a daily basis, the manipulating Jews or the anything else Jew. Germany, I sadly found out, was obsessed with Jews. Even those who claimed to, to like Jews had very strange thoughts about them. Some told me that all Jews know each other. Others said that all Jews helped each other. And still others claimed that all Jews are very good with uh, with money. Apparently she hasn't talked to any poor ones. She submitted the book uh, to the publisher and the first person to proofread it liked it very much. Obviously she's a very skilled writer. Uh, the head of the publishing company though was uh, infuriated. He uh, belongs to one of the leading families uh, in the country. He went into a rage, she said. He said that the only way we'll publish that is if everywhere you print the word Jew you substitute it for Israel or Israeli. Because again, that's the modern new anti-Semitism is that you can say these horrible things against Israel because they're a country and not be accused of being a racist. Of course, Israel's the Jewish state, but it's, uh, it's just simply semantics. But, uh, uh, but of course, she refused to do that. Uh, the book was finally published by a small publisher in America of the Jewish Theater of uh, New York. Uh, the title of the book was I Slept in, uh, in Hitler's Room. But uh, again, uh, it's not just Germany, it's all over Western Europe and it's uh, growing in uh, this country as well. Uh, and part of the problem is the church uh, and the church's view. 600 million worshipers out there every Sunday who are completely anti-Semitic because of replacement theology. The promises to Israel, well, they forfeited them and they now belong to the church. Well, Paul starts out, verse one, saying that that's, that hasn't happened. We're going to look at this chapter in three parts. We'll look at the first ten verses uh, this uh, morning, the believing remnant. Next week, we'll look at the temporary rejection of verse 11 to 24. And then the following week, we'll finish up the future restoration, verse 25 to 32. Uh, again, if we don't uh, know these chapters, we'll fail to evangelize the Jewish people, who Jesus said the gospel is supposed to go to first, and then the Gentiles will fall into <laughs> anti-Semitism 
will fail to trust the promises of God. Well, let's look at the examples of the remnant in verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. There's our answer. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or you do not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, I have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So Paul, of course, makes himself the, the first example. His testimony, uh, by, uh, written by Luke, Dr. Luke uh, records that testimony three times in, in the book of Acts. Uh, and uh, it's, it's for a very good reason. Paul calls himself one born out of due time. Uh, in 1 Timothy 1.16, he says of himself, However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me, first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Again, Paul's a persecutor of the church. Uh, he's out torturing Christians, trying to get them to deny their faith, breaking up families, putting people in prison. He's there, we know from the book of Acts, holding the coats of those that are uh, stoning Stephen, killing him, the first martyr uh, of the church. He says, my life is an example of God's long suffering. But he also says and uses this word that it's a pattern, which is very interesting. Now, how, what kind of a pattern is Paul's testimony? Now, we could say in a very general sense, his is the pattern of, quote, an adult conversion where he has this notorious sinful life, like mine, and then he gets converted, uh, and uh, that's detailed out, uh, and then the changes and the fruit of that light uh, afterwards, the adult conversion in a general sense. But a more specific sense that he applies it here, I believe, is the nation of Israel. Because uh, not too many of us get saved like Paul. Anybody where you're just driving along the road and, the, and the God uh, knocks your car over uh, and he blinds you and you're laying on the side of uh, H1 and then there's a big voice that speaks out of heaven, tells you to go to somewhere in IAEA where some guy on Straight Street is going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And, is that any test and see, not too many testimonies like that. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, not quite that way. So what's the pattern? I think the pattern is the nation of Israel, I think, to this point. Yeah, uh, is there a remnant? Uh, uh, how about me? I'm Jewish. I think there is a remnant. And, uh, and he says, not only that, my life is a testimony of God's long suffering, but it's also a pattern of the Jewish people who are blinded in part, we'll see in verse 25, but doesn't mean God's not done with them because they are going to call upon him. They're going to repent, and he's going to return uh, Paul is part of the remnant. Elijah also is an historical example of this remnant, and he makes reference to, of course, the classic story of Elijah, where during the day of uh, uh, Ahab and Jezebel, very sweet couple that uh, you know practiced uh, you know uh, you know killing their children uh, to their gods and so forth, and uh, propagated that throughout uh, Israel, uh, and uh, and certainly they were out after the prophets of God. Uh, the, they were worshiping Baal. Uh, Baal as a god. Baal comes all the way back from the Babylonian uh, pantheon of gods and very prevalent. And the Canaanites uh, continue to plague uh, Israel there. But you remember the scene. Uh, Elijah's up on Mount Carmel. Uh, he's up there overlooking the, uh, the, the plains of Megiddo. Uh, there in northern Israel. And basically says to the people of Israel, how long will you waver between two opinions? If Baal is God, then serve him. But if the Lord is God, serve him. And the people said nothing. And, uh, and so what he does, he calls out the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. Says, listen, you guys build your altar. Uh, you put your sacrifice on there. All you got to do is call fire down from heaven, from your God, if he's real. And then we'll know he's the real deal. I, I'll just do the same thing. And of course, they go all day and chant and so forth. And he's, he's there mocking them, if you re, uh, remember. Makes a reference that perhaps your God is using the bathroom right now, and that's why he doesn't hear you, and a few other uh, little uh, lines like that. Kind of love Elijah, don't you? And, uh, and uh, he goes through this whole thing. Uh, they cut themselves. They go through all these gyrations. Nothing happens. And he goes, my turn. Uh, and then he pours gallons and gallons of water over the sacrifice. He actually builds a trench around it and fill, fills it, calls on God. Fire comes down out of heaven, consumes the whole thing. Not good for the uh, priest of Baal. 
uh, but good for the people of Israel to see that there is a, a God uh, in heaven. That's the one there to the worship. Of course, then Elijah, after this tremendous victory, finds out that uh, uh, Ahab and Jezebel are after him. So he takes off on a little sprint, runs 18 miles. I guess he was in pretty good shape, about ready to pass out at that point uh, and realizing that Jezebel is after him. That's when he says this line, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to, uh, to kill me. And of course, uh, God answers and says, except for the other 7,000 guys that are just like you. Paul's point here is there's a remnant. How big is it? A lot bigger than you think. A lot bigger than you think. Now remember when Peter preaches there in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, immediately there are 3,000, the beginning of that remnant, that are saved. Later in the book of Acts, uh, we find that there are 5,000 more added to the church, men besides women and children. And uh, as we've said uh, on other occasions, according to Josephus, at the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, there's 100,000 Jewish believers in Jerusalem that are able to flee in obedience to what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. When you see the city around it, surrounded, you better get out of town. And when that first siege by the Romans came around 68 AD, when they pulled back to resupply to the Mediterranean, they left, all 100,000 of them, and were spared the judgment that then came under Titus and the Roman legions of, of 70 AD. Uh, there's a remnant in Paul's day, he says. I'm part of it, I'm a pattern of it, uh, and it's bigger than you think. Look in the days of Elijah. Uh, two very good uh, examples of this remnant. Secondly, he talks about them and the fact that they were elected or chosen uh, there in verse in five and six. And so then, at the present time, first century AD, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Trying to make it very logical, very reasonable, uh, very plain and very simple. Uh, we would sure say the remnant has been elected, again, or this word uh, is actually, uh, uh, again, in the Greek, ek, ekloge, which uh, means uh, chosen. Uh, he's saying in the same way that everyone is chosen by God, elected by God, uh, it's by grace. Uh, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, God chose you and elected you uh, because you were such a good person. No, it was by grace. He knew you'd do great things for God one day. No, it was because of grace. He knew you'd be a great mom or dad and raise those kids. To, no, it was just simply by grace. It was all by grace that he chose us. Nobody is deserving. That's all the way back to our point uh, one and two in the principles of righteousness we've studied earlier. And it's the same uh, for this remnant. They've all been elected. They've all been chosen by grace. I don't think we have a problem with that if you're, if you're honest with yourself. And if you're not sure that God chose you uh, by grace, you think it might be something else, then just check with your spouse on the way home. Uh, they'll inform you otherwise. It was absolutely by, uh, by God's grace that we've uh, been saved. I think our problem is, well, what about the ones that are not saved? Or does that mean they're not chosen? You know, how do, how do we square that up? And of course, we, we struggle with that idea. And Paul certainly has balanced these two things. Chapter 9 is all about the sovereignty of God and his election. But then chapter 10, he turns it on his head, and it's all about man's free will choice. Uh, in fact, Romans 10, 13, his summary statement there, for whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the whoever's. Uh, who can come to the Lord? Whoever. Whoever would come to the Lord. When they come to faith in Christ, they find out that they were elected. According to the Paul, in Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world. Wow, that eliminates good stuff, good works, or uh, uh, anything else. Uh, again, verse 14, he, he continues of chapter 10. How then shall they call on in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? So I would say... If you're troubled about, what about those that are not elected? Well, then they need to hear. And to hear, they need to be sent. So 
That means you need to be involved, and really all of us, either preaching the gospel or at least sending the preacher uh, to get the gospel out there. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, the message of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection uh, on the cross. Paul says this remnant is there. He's an example. Uh, Elijah tells us there's more than you think there are. And certainly uh, we see the remnant uh, in his days. And they are saved in the same way by grace. And certainly election has its part. Now to uh, go over this again, even though he's mentioned it, this idea of salvation by grace. He says that uh, election is by grace. And therefore it can no longer be by grace. He uses uh, a bit of what's considered uh, logic. Now we would uh, attribute this kind of logic to Aristotle. Uh, Not everything Aristotle says is in the Bible, but the principles of logic that he used are in the Bible. uh, And this is one of them here, which simply says what something is, it is. Follow that? A dog is a dog. We okay with that? What something is not, It's not. A dog is not a cat. And then the point is, and it can't be both at the same time. Unfortunately, we don't teach a lot of this in our university systems anymore because we would say a dog is a dog. I don't feel like it's it's a dog. It it doesn't seem like a dog to me. Uh, To me, it seems like a very different animal. I mean, to me, I can, I'm sorry, it's just a dog. I mean, again, this is basic reasons of logic that Paul's using here, of course, in his illustration of grace and works. What is his point? Is that grace is grace, and grace is not works. And the two things are mutually exclusive. And uh, and certainly that's important. Was that an issue with with Jewish people in that day in the first century? Absolutely. (coughs) Uh, Because they were all about keeping the Torah, the 613 commands of of Moses, uh, the feast days, and uh, and everything else. So they could earn their salvation. But he says, no, it's by grace and by grace alone. I think most of us get this idea that we're saved by grace alone. Although there's, there's large numbers, large percentages of the church today still yet uh, denying this very key doctrine of the Bible to be saved by grace alone. Even those that accept that would still say, but once we are saved, once we have God's Holy Spirit in us, certainly the work of the Holy Spirit in us to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ has got to be helped out through my own works, through my own discipline. Uh, I can help it out. I can keep the rules now. I can keep the regulations. And so groups have developed their own systems of uh, rules and regulations so that you can know whether you're really a mature Christian or not uh, and we're to escape all of these things. Paul says in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, kind of the classic, just to read a few verses to make uh, our point come home a bit. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of works. It is the gift of God, not, uh, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward men, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We're saved by grace. And guess what? We're kept by grace as well. Uh, We are changed to the image of Jesus Christ uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit, which is by grace as well. We don't deserve any of it. It's all by God's grace. The wonder is not, does God send people to hell? The wonder is by his grace, he saves any of us. Because this whole point is none of us are deserving uh, at all. It's all by grace. And Paul says these two concepts, salvation by works and grace are mutually exclusive. And much of the letter to the church at Galatia is uh, developing that idea. Israel's main concern has always been trying to please God with good works. Uh, The nation refused to submit to Christ and his righteousness uh, that he offered. Being very good religious people, uh, they continue to refuse to submit it today. Some. But the remnant is saved by grace. God chose them. He elected them uh, in the same way. So again, the question he begins with, very rabbinical, beginning with the question, verse 1. I say them, has God cast away his people? Uh, Certainly not. 
Even though he rejected the nation, he saved individuals out of that nation referred to as the, as the remnant. Paul's an example, and, uh, and certainly there is the example of Elijah. And the people getting this letter, predominantly Jews in Rome in the first century, uh, they would go, amen, brother, because some of them would have been there possibly on the day of Pentecost, heard Peter preach, taken the gospel uh, back to Rome. Uh, so we have uh, an established church there long before any apostles ever made it. Remember, Paul's longing to visit them one day. He hasn't made it yet. And, uh, but uh, we know from the book of Acts, he does get there uh, eventually. Uh, and like all believers, they are chosen or elected by the grace of God. This leads to Paul's explanation of the nation's rejection itself in verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, uh, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. And as David says, Later, uh, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their necks always. Again, so if the remnant's been saved, that's proving uh, that uh, God is not through with his people. What happened to the rest of the nation? Why didn't the whole nation receive Christ? Paul gives an explanation here by quoting a couple of passages of scripture. He says first that... Uh, uh, well, most were blinded, or he says, Israel has not obtained what it seeks. They didn't obtain. What were they trying to obtain? Salvation by works. Uh, and they didn't obtain it. Because you can't. Because nobody can live that perfect, sinless life. James tells us that who, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in just one point, he's guilty of all of it. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? One. You liars. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we're all in that category. No, I've, I've never told. No, don't even go there. Uh, uh, if you stumble at just one point, you're guilty of all of it. They couldn't obtain it because nobody could live that perfect, sinless life. It was all meant to show them their need uh, of a Savior, uh, the need to be forgiven. Uh, a few were blessed apart from works, he says in verse 7, but the elect have obtained it. Why? Because they were elected. They were chosen by God, by grace. But many were blinded. Here he's quoting Isaiah 29.10. God's given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should uh, not see, ears that they should not hear uh, to this very day. It might seem a little cruel to us, but if we go back to chapter 9 and Paul's references to Pharaoh, in the same way that they're blinded, or we could use some translation, say hardened in terms of their hearts, the same thing happened to Pharaoh. Now remember, Moses goes to Pharaoh, you know, let my people go, uh, and then begins to dismantle uh, the gods of Egypt one by one through the plagues. And we have several confrontations between uh, the wise men uh, of Pharaoh, Pharaoh himself and uh, Moses uh, uh, and his brother. Uh, but basically what happens to Pharaoh as each one of these things gets ramped up and gets uh, more outrageous in terms of the plagues and what's going on, Rather than yielding to God and to God's word, Pharaoh hardened his heart and he hardened his heart until God says, that's it, buddy. It's all over for you. I'm going to make your heart so hard you'll never turn at this point. Uh, but no one will ever dispute what's happened here uh, in Egypt in terms of my judgment against you and my freeing my people out from under uh, your crushing blow in terms of the, the slavery. Uh, again, so that happened to Pharaoh. And the same thing happened to the nation of Israel. Uh, one writer, Everett Harrison, says that from an observation of the setting of the quotations, it's clear that God did not give his people deaf ears to mock them any more than he gave them blind eyes to taunt them. What was involved was a judicial punishment for failure to use God-given faculties to perceive his manifested power and to glorify him. They had a pretty good shot at Jesus there in person. Did every miracle, fulfilled every prophecy, everything they could have brought before him. They even brought, if you remember on one occasion, they brought, uh, they brought a, a guy that was deaf and mute. 
Uh, and they, because they knew rabbinically that uh, the way they cast a demon out of a person that was deaf and mute was to call and speak to that demon and find out its name and then call it out by its name. And we see that uh, in other places as well. So the thinking was rabbinically, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, if we, all we got to do is come up with a guy that is deaf, mute, and demon possessed because only the Messiah can cast that demon out. We've got him. And they bring the guy to Jesus, and he cast the demon out. And they all got down and worshipped him. No, what did they say? You did this by the power of the devil. I mean, wait, wait, what are their options? They've got to figure out some way that he does this. So the national rejection by the national leaders. And, uh, and there's a point in time when Jesus says, only parables to you guys. Uh, no more. And, uh, and it's kind of a scary thought as we'll kind of bring some application to this in a moment. Uh, there's a point in time where God gives his truth to such a point and afterwards he stops uh, and, uh, and their hearts are hardened. It happened with the nation of Israel. It happened with Pharaoh. Now, why did the judgment come? We're going to give you two reasons. And, and we need to kind of go to these passages and read them in a fuller sense to get uh, uh, the idea of what's going on. There in Isaiah 29, it's verse 10 that the, the quote is taken from. I'm going to read from there down to verse 13, where it says, For the Lord has poured out on you, as Isaiah prophesied, the spirit of deep sleep, and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets. He's covered your heads, namely the seers. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. Uh, and he says, I cannot, for it's sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is Ill illiterate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I'm not literate. Therefore, the Lord has said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but it have removed their hearts far from me. Here's God's word, and here's God's truth. Sorry, it's sealed. Here's God's word, and here's God's truth. Sorry, I'm illiterate. No, that's not the problem. You've removed your hearts from me. You come to me with your lips and with your mouths and you do all the right religious stuff, but you could care less about me. We call that a hypocrite. We call that a hypocrite. They were the pretenders. Jesus called them that on several occasions, didn't he? He called them, you hypocrites. And uh, did a little trash talking himself, those, those boys. If you've uh, read, the, read the Gospels, uh, it's a scary thing. Why does God bring judgment to a person and to a nation? Because of hypocrisy. Because they go through the motions and pretend like they're the real deal, and they're not. Secondly, Paul's explanation includes the problem of their religious experience. Again, in Romans 9 and 10, he cites Psalm 69, 22, and 23. But again, if we go back and read a little more, it'll be important. And as we start to read this, <laughs> we're going to read a couple of lines in here, and you're going to go, oh, oh, it's that. I'll show you what I mean. Psalm 69, verse 20. Reproach has broken my heart. Someone is speaking here. Isaiah's speaking in the future of someone's going to be saying this or at least thinking this. Reproach has broken my heart, and I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Who's that? Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross is saying these things. Here's what else he says. It continues. And here's our quote. So here's the context. Let their table become a snare before them. What's the table? A table of food. Meant to be a blessing. It's become a snare. Well, it's, it's turned from a blessing to a trap. And their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see. And make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents. For they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Wow. What did they do? They rejected Jesus on the cross. Jesus from the cross is saying, these guys are going to be judged because I came, I fulfilled every prophecy. I did every miracle. I am on the cross in fulfillment of Isaiah 53. I am the suffering servant. According to Psalm 22, I've been pierced. Uh, the stripes have been laid on me that their wounds might be healed, but they've been rejected. 
They're hypocrites, and they rejected me on the cross, and they're going to be judged. That's Paul's point here. What's the, again, it, there is a remnant, but why does God judge the nation? Hypocrisy and the rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. Two reasons. When did the judgment come? Again, 70 A.D. And it's sad to say the same mistake can be made today. People can just become hypocrites. And they go through all kind of cool-looking rituals and things that they do and wear the right clothes and say the right words, and their hearts are far from God. Uh, you can, you can, you can, if you follow them around a little bit, uh, you, you, you can tell. The proverb says even a child is known by its actions. Well, just follow the adult around and listen to him long enough, and you'll, you'll, you'll know as well. Not that Christians are perfect by, uh, by any means. Uh, but there's a, certainly a difference between somebody who's the complete pretender. In the same way, uh, the person that rejects Jesus over and over and over again when the gospel is, is presented is actually on shaky ground. That's why sometimes when we make an altar call, we're kind of pleading, we're kind of begging. Uh, it's because we're afraid if we understand this. Because people can hear it so much, they just get calloused uh, to it. But the warning is for all of us. Listen to uh, this warning of Hebrews 3. I think it's Paul writing here. Either way, the writer says, but exhort, and the NIV says encourage, but exhort or encourage one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened. That's our same concern. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, a reference to, uh, again, uh, the wilderness wandering, uh, the uh, nation getting the report, the good report from uh, Joshua and Caleb, but the uh, bad report from the others uh, in uh, unbelief, choosing not to go into where God was leading them uh, and their hearts were hardened. But he says here in this setting, first century setting, that certainly speaks to us, don't let your heart be hardened through deceitfulness uh, it should be a concern whether our hearts are becoming hardened or not. How does that happen? Well, in the same way that a person can hear the gospel over and over and over and reject, 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 reject to where it, is, it just doesn't penetrate any longer. In the same way, a believer at the same time can actually hear God's word over and over and over again. And it just becomes a ritual in what we do. And we just come in and those are the songs. And I'm like, it's like, well, I think it's the fourth. Is, how many times are you going to do that song? If we, and I can't believe uh, you know, we, this message again. You got some good news for us here, Pastor. Uh, you know, uh, you know uh, you're going to tell me about anti-Semitism all day. And why is that a concern? It's like, uh, what else is in the Bible? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was teaching in his universities, <clears throat> and, uh, and he had a young guy up there preaching. He said he found himself with the temptation to just write and take care of things. And he came to realize they're teaching God's word. And every time that God's word is being taught, I'm to listen and my heart is to respond and obey. It doesn't matter who it is that's teaching it, even if it's one of these young kids. And he had put down his pen and he would just listen and listen for God to speak to him that he would obey to it. That's what we're supposed to do all the time. Whether it's a guy on the internet, a guy on the radio, you know, a CD, whatever it is, or, uh, you know, uh, in person. You know, we're supposed to be listening, and what is God saying, and how do I respond to that word? Why? Because we don't want our hearts to become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceptive by its very nature. You know, these, you know, things just don't jump out in front. Hey, want to sin today? No, it's just, it's a lot more subtle than that. Uh, and it leads to, again, this unbelief. Uh, today, you know, if you hear his voice, don't let your hearts be hard. We need to be careful. The Jewish people were entrusted with some pretty awesome truth and a tremendous awesome privilege. Can you imagine? I mean, we love, we love going to Israel. I mean, I, 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 you know, I love just sitting on the steps of the temple and know Jesus walked up and down these very steps. You know, and you can, you can in your mind picture the whole thing. And what would it have been like to live in that day and walk with Jesus up those steps and go in and the Hallel Psalms being sung and the whole thing and the orchestration of it all, and the massive menorah. And it's like, man, how cool would that be? But people did it. It was just, it was just another deal. It was just another deal. Uh, man, if it can happen to us, that's, that's the concern. We need to be very careful. 
It's a universal truth. Jesus addressed it in Matthew 13. In verse 13, he says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. He's talking about the Pharisees. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, and that I would heal them. That's what the Lord wants to do, isn't it? He wants to heal us in terms of salvation, but he wants to heal us of all the junk in our lives as, uh, uh, as well. And we've, got, uh, uh, and we've got plenty of it because we, we live in a pretty dirty world that's, uh, uh, that, that's out there. And, uh, and it should be a, a concern. It's a warning for all of us to never hear God's word uh, without responding to it. Paul makes it clear that the hardening of Israel is neither total nor final. And the proof of that is there's still a remnant and there's still a future uh, for them, as we'll look at uh, next, next week. The existence of a Jewish remnant in the first century and in Elijah's day is certainly proofs uh, that, uh, as Paul wouldn't say like Elijah, I'm the only one left. No, uh, God's uh, doing a tremendous work uh, among the Jewish people. He always has and he always will. Our next verse that we'll look at next week says uh, in verse 11, again I say, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? No, not at all. I like what the Living Bible says. Does this mean that God has rejected his Jewish people forever? Of course not. And he's going to go on and address it. And in addressing it, he finally turns in this whole letter. Finally, we get to, oh, yeah, and you Gentile guys, I've got a couple things to say to you as well. And what is he going to say? He says, hey, you should praise God because it was their rejection as a nation that brought the gospel to the, uh, to the rest of the world. And, of course, he's going to go on and says, and you might have a tendency to forget this, so let me give you a few illustrations and explain it further to you. And, of course, we have forgotten it as a church. Uh, the illustrations haven't done any good. And the church is predominantly replacement theology and predominantly anti-Semitic. Uh, and it's scary. And guess what the Bible says? In the last days, all the nations of the earth will turn against Israel. Wow, it kind of sounds like today. Uh, very interesting. To get your uh, news from CNN, you might want to rethink that. They are 90% owned by businessmen from Saudi Arabia. You can just see why they might kind of uh, be just slightly anti-Semitic in terms of the way they, uh, they present things and present the, the media to you. And, uh, and we don't really hear about uh, a lot of the good news uh, in Israel, certainly. We don't agree with everything they do. We don't agree with every policy. But we do believe in God's word that says uh, to Abraham and his physical descendants, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. And that needs to be a concern. It needs to be a concern for us as a church. It needs to be a concern for us as a nation. We're in trouble. We are returning our back on Israel. There are certainly people in important positions that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we're, we should be concerned about, but predominantly across the aisle in Congress, they are very supportive of the nation of Israel, and we can be very thankful for that. But uh, we need to be concerned. If we don't understand this, we'll fail to evangelize uh, our Jewish brothers. Uh, we'll fail to really apprehend the promises of God, because if they failed them, they might fail us. But Paul says his plan hasn't failed. Uh, the remnant is here. And the restoration is coming uh, in the future. We'll be looking at that in a few weeks. Let's pray. The earth can shake, the sky come down, the mountains all. Fall to the ground, but I will fear none of these things. You shelter me, Lord, underneath your wings. Dark waters rise and thunders pound. The wheels of war are going round, and all the walls are crumbling.
and thunders pound. The wheels of war are going round, and all the walls are crumbling. Shatter me, Lord, underneath your wings, shelter me. Hide me underneath your wings. Hide me deep inside. Call for me someday when time no more shall be. I'll say, Oh, death, where is your sting? You shatter me, Lord, underneath your wing. Help me, hide me underneath your wing. Hide me deep inside your. Someday when time no more shall be, I'll say, oh death, where is your sting? You shatter me, Lord, underneath your wings. 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 Rescued my soul, given me strength, answered my every call, given me light, opened my eyes, covered my heart with your and I magnify, I magnify, I magnify you, Lord. In your profound peace, your blood wash me clean, your spirit of together.
go with the highest hopes with fullness.